DOC, as always, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. You know, I, you have so many things going on, but how, how are you doing first and foremost? Justin, I'm blessed and I'm thankful and I'm grateful every day for the opportunity, you know, to, uh, to do some good stuff. Hmm. Word up. Now you're in Dallas right now. And, uh, you know, I think quite a bit about what your life might have been like growing up. Now, I'm, I've, I've been blessed to see the documentary. So I got to see pictures and pieces of, of what it was like for you growing up uh, in uh, Lake West. But for you, what was that environment like? For, for those, obviously, for people who haven't seen the documentary, but also as you, you know, embark on what I think is also another pivotal year for you, when you look back at how you grew up and where you grew up, what comes to mind? Community. And that is, uh, that's sort of a testament, a testament to where I am now and where I consider myself going. Uh, Cause growing up in, in, in West Dallas and the projects in Lake West, um, you didn't know you were poor, you know? You lived in this huge development where everybody was poor and everybody didn't have nothing and everybody played in the dirt. And you know, uh, the projects is huge uh, in West Dallas and you have to walk from one side to the other side. And that was always that you don't go to the other side, but it wasn't gang bang type stuff, you know? Um, we were all happy to be there. Um, we were all happy to to coexist, and well, no, no matter what color you was, black or brown, even the poor white folks that lived over there were community, and so uh, that's what I remember most about that time period. When you said there was no gang banging, are you speaking about it from an LA sense, for yeah. example, or just a universal sense? Because when I moved out here from the south. I, we didn't have anything that was nearly as organized as what I experienced when I moved to LA. Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. I mean, I tell people all the time, I flew over. I flew over the dope game and the gangbang era when I traveled from Dallas to LA in 87. Because it hadn't really just blew up here and taken over. When I went to LA, I got thrust into that space and was like, holy hell, what the is going on around here? But 18 months later, when I came back to Dallas, Dallas was now a carbon copy of what I what, what was in L.A. What do you think the tipping point for that was? You know, was it the popularity of the songs? Was it people moving from L.A.? I mean, it sounds like you were surprised you go back home and yeah. you're running into the brand new thing that you'd experienced for 18 months. Yeah, back then, I mean, when I left, Houdini was coming down here every other weekend and everybody was wearing leather and they wanted to be from New York City. And then I went to LA and came back 18 months later. Everybody's wearing white tees and sagging 501s and wearing uh, chucks. You know, it's like everybody was easy when I got back home. When I left, everybody was Grandmaster D, you know. When I came back, everybody was easy. Wow. You know, uh, one of the other things in the documentary I, I've was actually my first time seeing a lot of visuals around, I will say, was uh, they had segments in there talking about the Feel of Fresh crew and uh, how impactful that your group was in Dallas um, and sort of the, I guess, the local breakout tracks that you guys, you know, you know put out. You know, how did the F Feel It Fresh crew come together? And if you can, just share with people the, that first moment when you broke, when you guys broke Dallas Radio. Well, uh, the Feel It Fresh crew came together through uh, a dance group called the Rockets. Break, uh, Bray was breaking here before it was rapping. And they were breaking a break dance group called the Rockets. They asked me to do an intro for them, which I did at a few local places. And a local television station 
saw it and asked if we could do that for for their evening lineup. And so we did that for them. It was Channel 21 station here in Dallas, and I searched high and low trying to find those old commercials. Couldn't find them. You really, they, they, the people would have really loved that. But a guy who had recently come to the city who was working for K104, the number one's radio station, had just got here from L.A., and he had been involved with the, uh, the world-class wrecking crew, the DJ group, Alonzo and those guys. And so uh, when he saw our commercials and saw us at one of his events, he approached me and, and the guy, Fresh K, who was the other person in the group, and said, let's make a group together, you know. And well, he was the number one dude on radio. So, of course, we was like, hell yeah, let's do it. And uh, we made a song called I Hate to Go to Work in his garage. And uh, a guy named Tom Joyner, a DJ in Dallas, took to playing it every day on, on, his, ra on his morning radio show. And so we became really popular. And it was through that relationship that everything sort of blossomed. I mean, you had to, you, you took a risk there, you know. Um, I mean, as the story goes, as I understand it, uh, Alonzo and Dre, you know, they talked about how you were incredible and, you know, come out to LA. And you're like, yeah, we'll be out there. But they didn't mean the whole Feel of Fresh crew. They meant you. Yeah. I mean, that feels like, that, that is a, a risky kind of situation to be in. You know, when you hear that, that type of offer. What was going through your mind at that time? Hell no. I'm not doing that. You know, I don't know anything about California. I don't know you niggas like that. And I'm not coming out there. I don't know nobody out there. Uh, uh, I had the utmost respect for Dre's uh, production skill set, though. He was everything. But I didn't know him. You know, and I damn sure wasn't uh, just going to leave my group. I can't just leave my group with these nuts. And so I told him no, you know, the first time. And about four or five months later, my mother threatened to send me to an arm, to the Army because um, I was dropping out of high school to become an entertainer. And she was like, entertain my ass. You know, you, you go into the Army because you're not gonna be out in these streets doing nothing. And so uh, when she said that, I had to really rethink, rethink Dr. Dre's offer. And I reached out to him uh, and he said, the offer still stands. Um, he said, I, I don't have any place for you to live, but if you could find a place, you should come out. You know, I think we could, we could really do it. And so uh, I found a place to live. Um, and just said, you know, on a wing and a prayer, just left. I didn't tell anybody I was going. I basically just ran, ran away and shit to the circus. But it worked. I, you know, I, I get the sense that you came from a musical family. You know, I, I get the sense. I mean, and, and maybe I'm off base by this, but I feel like there was other members in your family who were singers, other people who were, were uh, creatively talented. Am I, am I off base with that? Only my dad. My dad fancied himself a singer, still does. Um, but I, I don't know, for whatever reason, he just had never had the chops to go for it. You know, down here in the South, I imagine, that especially during his time, growing up, things were still segregated. And uh, life was probably a lot different as far as opportunity is concerned. Um, but as I started to do, some of the history behind our name. There is a theater called the Academy of uh, the Black Academy of Arts and Letters downtown. There's a theater inside that building that's named after uh, a great relative of mine. So to say that the arts are in this bloodline is is right on the money. I just don't know them. Why do you think your mom had reservations about you being an entertainer? 
Uh, like I said, you know, they grew up in a different era. You know what I mean? And we don't want to gloss over racism like, like they do these days, as if it's just a word and not a reality, um, as if it's just a temperament and, and uh, you know, not a plight. Um, people have to deal with that, you know, and folks down here, uh, especially in my mother's age group, probably had to deal with it in a cold-blooded way. So she probably never saw the opportunities that, that I saw as a kid. She thought, uh, you know, I'd end up being in the, in the streets and doing what my cousins did, just hanging around and, you know, want to be a thug guy or go to jail or this. And she didn't want that. One of my uncles was a Marine and uh, he did really well for himself built him a really great family and, and is one of the veterans that we, that we thank uh, every year um, on Memorial Day. And so she wanted me to be like him. He's her older brother and she wanted that for her son. And so you run away like you were joining the circus. You know what I mean? You get to- Let me get the hell out of here. Uh, and you get to L.A., and you get to the studio, and you're with N.W.A. You know, I think of Ice Cube as being one of the most competitive MCs I've ever had the pleasure of being around, I've ever heard on Wax, just in general. You know, it seemed like he was writing against the entire world every time I heard him. You know, I look at Eazy e as a personality I don't think we've ever seen uh, a visionary, an entertainer, I don't think we've ever seen, ever, you know, and I don't say that lightly because we've seen a lot of incredible people, especially coming out of this camp. And then there's Dr. Dre, who is the wizard of all wizards, the most successful producer in hip hop history. And, you know, you got Yella, you got Ren, you've got the iconic NWA. And you sit down in that studio session the first time. What goes through your mind? How do you feel? I mean, you're a fish out of two waters, in my opinion. No disrespect, but you're from the South. You sound like an East Coast cat. You just landed in L.A. Well, rap, rap hadn't, rap hadn't made its self, uh, hadn't created its place yet. Everything was still East Coast. Um, all the rap in L.A. was mostly. J.J. Fad and the, and the World Class Wrecking Crew and uh, the L.A. Dream Team. It was really poppy. And, and uh, you know, it hadn't found its, uh, its space yet. But people like King T uh, were starting to show up in Easy and N.W.A. and Too Short. Uh, once they made Colors, the movie, and Ice-T started to break out. Then they started to really define their identity. But because most of that music was so uh, street, for lack of a better way of putting it, uh, the radio what wasn't having any of it out there. And so they could never really get on like the guys in New, in New York were getting on because L.A. radio wasn't having it. Mm -hmm. But I knew that. Mm -hmm. Cubes like, likes to say they never thought that they were going to be any bigger than, you know, underground artists and neighborhood artists. But I knew, I didn't, I never thought that. I knew what was there, uh, not just because of Cube's skill set and Dre's skill set, but mainly, you know, because of those two skill sets, I knew how big they were if they could get over that line. So I, I took it upon myself to be the guy to help them, you know, sort of turn what they were doing into um, commercially viable records, you know, subject matter and content. I used to always say, I make it so the white folks can hear it and like it and laugh and have fun and yada, yada, yada. Because if you do that, then it makes the corporate people more apt to want to be next to you and not run from you, which was their hang up, you know? And, uh, and, and J 
just turns out that that was the key that they needed because once Easy e got on the radio, then you couldn't hold him back. Once he got that video on air, then it was pretty much over. Mm. We won Easy. Did you have to convince them that that was the way to go or did it kind of happen organically? For example, yeah. did you write that track and then they were like, oh, this is it? No, uh, we won Easy. Uh, the, the, I got to LA about about three days after I got to LA is when we went to the studio. We went to the studio and Dre pulled up the Bootsy Collins track and said, do you have anything for this? And I wrote, wrote the, the song out and laid it in the easy, took the song home to learn it and came back the next day and laid it. And a week later, it was the number one song. It was the number one song, um, damn near in the country, certainly at radio in LA. And after that, everything changed. Um, Dre got a new place to live, which got me out of the digs I was at in Compton and let me live on his floor, which I was so thankful for um, and everything. And that's, for me at least, that's when the th everything just took off. 10 days. 10 days after you leave and join the circus. You three days, you get in the studio, you're at 10, wow. 10 days later, it took, um, from the moment this whole journey started with a prayer to God to let me be the best. If you let me be the best, I'm gonna tell everybody it was you. Da, 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 da. From that prayer, which is about four to five months before I left Dallas, from that prayer, 18 months later, my record came out. So from that prayer, it took 18 months to do We Want Ease, I mean, to do Easy Does It, Straight Outta Compton, and no one could do it better. All three of them are out. Um, and there's, there's two, there's a double platinum, a platinum, and a gold record, all in 18 months. Mm. You know, you have been, I mean, you've said this a bunch of times, like you have been inspired by East Coast lyricists. You know, you've, you know, Rakim, Big Daddy Kane. Uh, have you ever battled Ice Cube? Did you guys battle a lot? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But we never called it that. But hell, yeah. Every day, you know, um, because Ice Cube is, is, is much better as a writer at some things than I am. I know I can't compete with him in that space, but I am was better at certain things in that space that you couldn't do. And so I just hung on my thing and, uh, and together we, we bridged along with the help of Ren, who sort of balanced it all out, um, came up with some really cool stuff, man. And, and we all helped. Uh, both Dre and Easy grow into what they would become, you know, as artists. And you owe those three guys uh, a lot of credit for your, well, you should be giving those three guys a lot of credit for building that movement, you know, because uh, even though for us it was just going to the studio, having fun every day, drinking eight balls and talking noise and yada, yada, yada. Uh, we were really creating the West Coast sound. So in your head, do you feel like you won most of the battles that you didn't call battles? Or do you feel like... I won my share. And he won his share. You know, there were certain times when you'd write your rap and then you hear his rap and maybe you don't let them hear your rap because you know you got to write another rap, you know? Or maybe they lay a verse and then you go lay your verse and magically a few days later, they verses changed into something else, you know? Yeah, that there was a lot of that going on. Um, but iron sharpens iron, bro. And it was friendly competition. 
because we had massive amounts of respect for one another, and we all we all saw each other as one 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 entity, one group. Mm. You know, the grand finale is such an epic track. I mean, to me, it's uh, it's right there with the symphony. You know, it is. You know, I it it resonates with me deeply. When I look back, obviously, because that is the last time that version of NWA was all on a track together. Isn't that amazing? And so poignant that it was called the grand finale. You know, because that was it. That was the last NWA song ever made. That was it. That was the grand finale. Now, there have been uh, renditions of guys coming back together, but this is just my humble opinion. You could never make another NWA record because easy has gone. You know, it just doesn't exist anymore without that piece. You know, uh -huh. those guys could come together and celebrate. Uh, but what Easy meant to that whole movement was just so massive, you can't duplicate it, you know. Uh, that's just my humble opinion. There's a quote here from uh, uh, Dick Griffey. And maybe you've seen this before, but Dick Griffey, he had a quote about you. He said, the DOC was the guy that came up with those great stories. He was probably the single most influential person in gangster rap. Mm. Well, I played my role for sure. You know, uh, but I follow, man, you know, I just wanted to be a part of a winning team back then. And I was uh, in Cube. Bar for bar, you know, I did my part, but Cube's got some of the greatest stories ever on wax, you know, and they're real. And, you know, it's like these aren't uh, based on things. They're the real things translated into wax, and they just work really well. Uh and I use no Vaseline, probably because I'm not in it. And, uh, you know, that that to me was Cube's mark on the West Coast, period. You know, that, that made him the coldest, you know, in the game to me on the West Coast. Uh, you know, before Snoop came along, uh, there was nobody but you uh, for me, you know, and, and I held a, a space somewhere in that universe, but I followed behind Cube Ice, man, if I'm being really honest. He's the voice, the heart and soul of that movement for me. How did you avoid being uh, named <laughs> or not named on <laughs> No Vesely? I think uh, by the, it was after the wreck. And I think you, who has a lot of respect for me, bro, and love for me, I think he probably felt like it would just be like pushing around a handicapped kid or something uh, by rapping, you know, because I couldn't fight back. Like, what was I going to do? Um, there was a dude named Tweety Bird, Loke, who's a rapper from Compton, and he made a rap record talking bad about me and I, my red, I never, I don't, I don't know if I ever even met this person, uh, but but it was, that song was pretty hurtful for me. So I, I just feel blessed that Cube never, you know, cause when No Vaseline came out, when you walked into a room and, and people would, they loved that record, you know what I mean? Cause it was a great song and he was tearing their ass up, you know, I was just, <laughs> Very thankful that he let me he let me be free. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is uh under that under that angle. Because I don't think Tupac would have done something like that. 
Right, because Tupac, when Tupac was battling cats, he'd be like, doesn't one of them got sickle cell or something? Oh, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, that was a great he'd opportunity. He'd have told my ass up if, if we'd have been fighting. I mean, hell, he went, he, he killed Dre on some music, didn't he? Talk noise about Dre. And talk about biting them out, biting the hand that feeds you. You know what I mean? Uh, but Pac was a rebel, you know? <laughs> We have a lot of similarities, he and I. Although we never got as close as he and all of those other folks. Um, his heart is for all of us as a collective. And, and and I share that. And Cube shares that, that sentiment, you know. We we are so much better as a collective than we are as as one guy going out here trying to change the world. But when you add money, it's it's difficult to keep everybody focused on one thing. What was your relationship with Suge like after your wreck? Like, you know, the year or two after you were dealing with all of the repercussions of a really tragic night? Suge has always kind of been my guy. But there's absolutely a guy before the wreck and a guy after the wreck. You know what I mean? Um, but he always watched me, always had my back. Um, never let any crazy stuff come my way or happen to me. Um, you know, besides taking my credit and my money. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, he was always cool to me, you know. Um, and it's not his, I never looked at it as, as it was his fault because I wasn't in a space I could do better business or be a better man than I was in that moment. Uh, but all of my all of my stuff is is purposeful. So uh, I think he had a really amazing opportunity to do some incredible stuff and show business as a way of, you know, messing with your head and not allowing you to see the forest for the trees, for lack of a better way of putting it. But the same thing that happened to Easy happened to him. You know, you couldn't see how big it was at the time. All you saw was how big you could be. Not knowing that if it's just you at the top, it makes it easier for you to fall. Instead of putting yourself, instead of building a bunch of millionaires around you so you could never fall. That's a really interesting parallel. The same thing that happened to Easy happened to Shook. Is this ego in that? Is that what you mean by that? Do you mind elaborating sure. on that? Sure. Yeah, ego, power and control. This is mine. Uh -uh. It was your. It, it wasn't yours when it didn't. When it wasn't worth millions, hundreds of million dollars, it wasn't yours. It was ours. But when it became worth a hundred million dollars, then then the paperwork started in and it became mine. This is mine. But it goes all the way back to the the reason Cube left NWA in the first place. The paperwork showed up and people start going into their corners and saying, This is mine, but this is mine. But it was so much money. Seventy-five grand a piece, I think the number was, for all of those guys, not me, mind you even though I did just as much work as anybody else. But they were all getting $7,500, $75,000 a piece to make themselves legitimately, legally a part of this group. But the group belonged to, you know, and it, and it just got all messed up. And, and Q was like, hey, I don't give a damn about all of that worth my money for the work I did. Now they're trying to justify deals this is just me shooting from the hip, trying to justify probably publishing deals that they had made on the group's perhaps, uh, behalf. You couldn't make those deals without these people. So they had already screwed the group up before it had even really even formed itself um, into the machine that it could have become. And that's, that's the same thing with, with uh, Death Row. You know, I'm a very spiritual person. I'm someone who follows signs and the universe. And there's that scene in Compton. I think it was Compton. I'm pretty sure it was Compton where I saw this. But where Suge and Dre, I think you're in this scene too. 
everyone's trying to figure out the name of the group. And he says, Death Row. And someone's like, Death Row? Yeah, like Death, you know what I'm saying? Like Death Jam, Death Row. He's like, no, Death Row. Was that an accurate moment? Do you remember that moment? You know what? Something like that did happen. And I swear I'd like to think that I was the guy that said Death, Death Row. Because I thought it, we would be what Russell was to the East Coast. We could be that over here. Because at that time, Def Jam was it. You know, I thought that this could be Def Row. It's a play on prisons. And all you guys seem to love that sort of thing. <laughs> and it could really be cool. I think one other person, and if I'm not mistaken, that person was Jewels, uh, R.I.P., who said, yeah, death row. And, and, and then it went like, a, like wildfire. They all agreed to that. And that was it. And from then on, that's what it was. And at least that's how I remember it. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Mm -hmm. And then they got the little thing. One of, one of Dre's people drew the little logo. And then that was just it after that. It was all death row. It used to be Future Shock, you know, before that. And Future Shock was was my my was Dre and my company. So our company. And Dick Griffey and uh, Shug owned shares in his company. And it felt like we were finna, you know, make something special. Which we did, you know. Uh, but by the time it got to the peoples, it had morphed into death row. And Harry O uh, had come in and, you know, it had turned into something different. And I, I was powerless. And I was probably powerless way before that. I just didn't know it because uh, I was high or drunk or both, you know, uh, eight out of ten days um, being around all of that mess. It worked, man. And like you said, it's a G-O-D thing, it's not a D-O-C thing. Everything happened and, and went the way, exactly the way it was supposed to go so that you and I could be sitting here having this conversation about it today. That's how the right. universe works. Right. Man, on the beginning of, on the chronic, on the beginning of the chronic, which, you know, is arguably the greatest hip hop album of all time, Definitely an album that's all the time referenced in comparison with a very small handful of other greatest rap albums of all time. And, you know, being around you, of course, uh, being a, a child of the culture, growing up in hip hop, of course. It's still amazing to me that all of these different levels of disruption had been happening all around everybody involved, right? You've got, you know, Dre is is coming off of NWA, his... his uh, uh, the the way the business didn't work out. Jerry Heller, Easy passing away. Um, you guys starting your own label, Ice Cube venturing out, and you still make the chronic. <laughs> like like most people would just have cratered, collapsed, had a heart attack, given up, quit, chosen an entirely different different uh, avenue, or just sat back on the success they'd had already. All of you guys came together and made arguably the greatest rap album of all time. To me, that shows a sign of being able to harness different types of energies, whether positive or negative, to create something beautiful for the world. What was the temperature tone during the chronic sessions like? There's no difference between the sessions in the NWA days and the chronic days when it comes to the music being made. The only difference is that the element that's surrounding us while we're making music changed. It intensified on that, what you want to call gangster level, where it started being just a whole bunch of uh, street corner kind of people that were really about that life instead of being about the music life, hanging out, you know? Um, with NWA, it was still street guys, 
I'm hanging out. Some guys were street corner guys, but most of us were just musicians. And most of those people were just happy to be around great music. And so by the time it got to death row, the only difference was these are guys that were either going, either on their way to the penitentiary or just coming home from the penitentiary. And this was like the amusement park for them, you know, for the rest of us, or at least for me, it was hell, you know, going in there and dealing with these folks on a day to day basis, because I never knew which day could be my day. That's some terrible shit happens to you and, you know, but like I said, sure was overly protective and folks knew don't mess with that one, you know, leave that one alone. You know? And so I always felt uh, grateful to Suge for, for that, being able to exist in that space and not be, you know, so worried that something was going to happen because it was still guys that was hanging around with that bully mentality that want to poke you and push push your buttons because they know they can do it. They know you're not going to do nothing kind of stuff. Mm. But for the most part, most of those guys were really respectful and just left me alone. And Snoop was always one to say, Doc, you never have to worry about nothing as long as I'm around you. Uh, me and my folks are going to always make sure that you are taken care of, which is why they made me a, a dog pound guy. Two quotes that stand out to me from that time. Because again, I, you know, I think for a lot of people, especially if you were around that time or even new fans now who discover this album and discover all this great, great work, it's sometimes difficult to piece the relationships between people as accurately as possible. And I think the, the Chronic does two ways to show how important you were to that organization collectively, but also to people in there individually. And one part is in the beginning where he says, peace to the DOC, still making it funky though. Like at the beginning, you know, before we even get into the, 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 the adventures, Snoop lets it be known. And the second one is in the liner notes. It says, I want to give a special shout out to the DOC for talking me into doing this album. And that one was from Dre. Do you remember those two, two quotes? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, I remember the headache it was talking Dre into the record. But I remember the joy that I got from Snoop allowing me to pour into him. You know, that was right after the wreck, pretty much. And so I lived through Snoop. You know what I mean? Like I was, in my mind, I was the best. I was, I was the best thing since sliced bread, spitting in a microphone back in those days. And to be able to pour into the dog, and then he'd jump out there in the world like that. I, I got a chance to live through that. You know what I mean? Uh, I put my names in all of the songs and stuff. So, and you see me in the in the low rider. I mean, that's that, you know, I took that passenger seat was my life. And I lived to to be that guy, you know, and Snoop never forgot it. Like the, you want to give it up to the DOC, still making it funky enough. To this date, he still does that at every turn, every opportunity that he gets. He shines lights on me, you know, and I could never repay him for that, you know. I could just love him the way he loved me. Same thing with the good doctor. Mm -hmm. Life is a journey. Everybody has their path that they have to walk, you know? And so we, those three men, we've always loved each other enough to circle the wagons around each other when the time came. So this documentary, that's what happened. Those guys circled the wagon and really showed up and showed out. You know, you've never seen Dre on camera like you see him in this documentary. The guys, fucking happy and shit. You, you never see Dre happy. You know, he's always uh, melancholy and he's always very stern and he's never gonna let you see him in a vulnerable place, you know? Mm. But in this documentary, you could tell he really loves that guy. Wow, he really loves that guy. Same thing with him. 
You never see him like that. You know, you've never seen Badu like that. Some of the stuff that that Q gives you in in, in Easy and Exhibit and Do Your Heart is really a testimony to us as people. A testimony to me as a good man that all of these folks who have become icons came together to make some really cool art um, for my benefit, you know. And I know it's a G-O-D thing. It's not a D-O-C thing. I don't take it, uh, credit for it. Uh, I give all glory where it's supposed to go. And, and these guys are all, all my great friends, even to this day. And I can't wait for the world to see it, man. I, I'm so super proud of it. I know that there's a white man that's 50 years old that's, that lives in Boston that has never heard a rap song in his life that's going to see that film and see himself in it. And not too many rappers can do that. That's like uh, crossing over. See, I live in a rare space that some that very few people can live in. You know, Puke Doggy Dog and, and Run DMC and acts like that can live in this air. Um, but I get to live in this space just because of the person I am. That's where the fast ones kind of shows you that. And I didn't even know that when I made that record with the co-defendants. I didn't know that punk rock world loved Doc. I didn't even know the punk rock world knew who the hell Doc was, even though it makes perfect sense because there's so much synergy between NWA and punk music, you know, and, uh, and Public Enemy and those kind of records, the anti-system kind of uh, attitude towards building records. Um, so when I made Fast Ones with uh, the co-defendants, that they really liked that record. Uh, the co-defendants asked me, Fat Mike asked me, I'm supposed to be there next week, I'm supposed to be there this week or next week. They want a couple more songs and I can't wait to do it, you know, because uh, it had been 30 years since I'd been on stage in front of 20,000 people that knew the words and couldn't wait to hear it and were happy. And, you know, they followed me around and I took a thousand pictures and, you know, it's just really dope. And so um, the music is, is sort of the place where we all come together and I'm just grateful. And I mean, whatever genre, whatever race, um, it's just where people meet to, to come together and do some amazing stuff. So I'm just blessed to be able to live in that space. You know, your verse in, on Fast Ones, one, it's, uh, I love it. It's an incredible verse, incredible track. You know, the album, This Is Crime Wave by Codefendant, it's a punk, hip hop, fluid genre album. But there are some very quintessential hip hop tones and direction throughout the entire projects, especially on Fast Ones too. And you have a lot, you have a line on Fast Ones, which, you know, every time I hear it, uh, it really captures to me the emotional growth that you have gone through your whole life, right? Or at least since the car wreck, we'll say. And um, you say, I've been living so off balance that even drowning's a fucking challenge. Violence everywhere. It's on, a fantasy island, niggas wildin'. Right. I mean, even drownings a fucking challenge. I mean, that's a that's a weighty bar. Like, where does that come from? That comes for people from who might not be familiar with the song or for of, of your story. Like, let's go into that if you can. In in my mind's eye, it represents a failed suicide attempt. You know, couldn't even get that right. You know. Mm. But like I said, it's just being in that space where you're doing so much stuff to your body. Subconsciously, you got to be trying to get out of here. You know, there's no way you could these five pills and you just take them all with, without some kind of knowledge that this could be it, you know. And I remember a couple of times where it was close, you know, and... <laughs> When you, when you say, fuck it, you know, you're brave at that moment. But when them, when your arm starts tingling and you get that pain shooting, 
then you get scared as fuck and you and you think it to yourself, oh my God, why did I, you know? Uh, but, you know, thank God I'm still here, you know, and and made it through all of that stuff. And, and, and just recently, as of several, several months ago, it was January the 11th, 2023, is when I had taken my last drink as that person, you know. Um, Sir Jinx, who was one of the guys from the posse, NWA, if you will, he said to me on that day, he said, uh, when's your birthday? Because uh, he hadn't, hadn't seen me drinking in a while, even though I had been. Just don't spend enough time around them. And I didn't understand what he meant. He said, your birthday is the day that you quit drinking. He said, if you don't have a birthday, it means that you're going to end up drinking again. My, my grandmother's birthday is June, January the 10th. So this was conversation happened the day after her birthday. And I just thought to myself, wow, what a great day to have a birthday. And so I determined that that day I wasn't going to drink no more. You know, mm -hmm. I said that, uh, if not, if not just to prove to the universe that I'm ready for the next level of growth, that's going to be what I give back to this thing, the, the drinking and the drugs. And besides smoking some weed, which I do, uh, but those other things, I gave them all back. And um, I think that was my last gift, you know, to G.O.D. to let him know I'm prepared for this journey that he's, he's going to put me on. Because I would still been doing all of that stuff all throughout building this documentary, uh, learning about myself. Through, through the process, but just determine from that conversation that I had with Sir Jinx that now it's the time to grow up. I mean, it's uh, it's remarkable how much death was just around energetically, even in conversations, and not just with Death Row, but just like in the 90s, like, will I be alive when I'm 25? Life after death, ready to die. Um, um, uh, Mo murder, mo murder. Like, I mean, every, there was just, uh, even if you look at album covers from that era, they are just dark and grim, you know? And so when I hear that verse from Fast Ones, especially that line, it really resonates with me how long you had been dealing with thoughts of suicide or attempts at suicide. And, and to make it through all that really is a testament to what I feel like is at the core of all your conversations, which is faith and it's a G-O-D thing. That's it. I mean, it sounds like it got really dark. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, I, you have to wait for the series, right? This documentary is going to give you a people look into this story. But there's so much meat in it. And the testimony serves people that might not go to the potter's house on Sundays. You know, they need God, too. They need to know he exists. They need to know he's immediate. They need to know that he's there. I'm just here to make the change, you know, cause it's G.O.D. doing it. And so the only statistic I'm worried about is how many babies I can, I can help. And if I gotta do it one at a time, I will. You know, one of the things I, that was really beautiful coming through the documentary, because there's a through line with family, right? It starts off with your family. It goes into your family with Dr. Dre, Snoop, the challenges, and then it gets to your current family and your wife. You guys have a baby in the documentary, and Erica Badu is the doula. Yeah, and it's a just it's a, just a powerful expression of what you're talking about, right? You're talking about um, making things better for the future, valuing the people that you love, you know. Uh, and it seems like you guys have a beautiful extended family, you know, from what I've seen in the documentary. How important? is your wife and Erica and your, the people who are around you closest to you for the mind state that you're in and the challenges that you've gotten through. That's my backbone, bro. Like uh, any man that's worth his salt knows that you don't do this shit by yourself. You know, mm -hmm. you need a helpmate. That's why I said 
they give you one, you know. Otherwise, you'll be running around at 60 years old trying to act like a 17-year-old kid and hump every dress that, that, that you walk by. Um, and you're going to die doing that, you know what I mean? Like, at 60 years old, you ain't got the same giddy up in your get along, you know, that, 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 that shit'll get you out of here very quickly. Um, I forget who was that said, it's a comedian said, Richard Pryor says, dad died screwing. Think that he said that in one of his specials and said, there's no better way you could go, you know, uh, than having sex. Uh, and it was funny as hell, but I'd much rather go um, just laying in the bed, go, going to sleep with all these kids everywhere. And you get to see all these things that you've done and that everybody really cares and that you did good with the time that you had. You know, if, if, I, if I'm going to bust one and go at the same time, it just seems anticlimactic if you'll excuse the pun. <laughs> because, you know, you don't know what the hell motherfuckers think. They might be like, damn, I'm glad that motherfucker got the hell out of here. He needed to be with that chick a long time ago. But, uh, you know, my kids are very important to me. Uh, my daughters and my sons, those are gifts to me uh, from God. And I choose to uh, show my appreciation for those gifts by trying to be a, a representative of what I think that they should be as, as human beings. Yeah, man, I think it's important for populations to have leaders they can relate to, you know what I mean? And I think, especially when it comes to a lot of young people in the music industry, there's always so much noise around things that they're creating these days, whether that's through social media or through how a post can trigger something somewhere else, so now people are you know, coming at you, or uh, having a difficulty identifying your own style because everybody's from the internet now, so everybody feels the same. And I think you're one of those leaders, especially when you're talking about elevating Dallas's profile musically, creatively, artistically. Who can say that they were, you know, impactful on multi-platinum hits at the same time also had to deal with a number of on the ground, real world noise and challenges that was surrounding everything. I don't think that's typical of the average music executive one, but definitely the average person who is trying to tell people how they should and shouldn't act. Yeah, I agree with that, you know, and I, I don't, I don't have any desire to be anybody's executive. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a street guy. I'm a, I'm a people person, you know, they call a lot of people say I'm the people's champ because I'm a people guy. I believe that we're, we're only as powerful as we could be together. You know, and nobody's talking to kids that come from where I come from in junior high school, high school and college about how important it is to uh, to come together and say, vote, you know, or things like that. Like th those things go way over the head, but you got so much power, especially in your local and state lives by entering into that space where you're avoid now nationally that's just a nightmare but when you're starting to come together um and, and uh, try to make change in your community in your school in your this and your that in the city when you're from then if you if you band together you got a lot of power to make things happen and folks are trying to do that they just don't know how to go out there and talk to these kids. Now that's something I do. I mean, that's that's something I have a way, and I don't mean just black ones from the south side. I mean white ones from from the north side. You know, I mean Coach McCarthy or the Cowboys. I got close with his family last year, and he invited me to every home game uh, last year, and I went to A and T, AT and T. And invariably, every time I visited that stadium, it was two or three little white kids would come up to me and want to talk to me about hip hop and want me to listen to their music and ask me what my thoughts are. So when I start thinking about creating this, this machine in Dallas that I'm terming the dreams experience 
It was so that I could get into these communities and help guide these children, not just on the northern or uh, southern side, because they needs it. Now, uh, but the kids on the northern side, because they need it too. You know, they need to know if you're going to be leaders, then you need to figure out how to lead. And I don't mean just be in power and control shit. I mean, get together and make changes for the betterment for everybody that's involved. And the kids on the North have a legacy that they have to deal with. Older generations of folks that they got to deal with to forge their new ways of thinking or their new paths. And so you got to give them a, you know, give them some room to grow too. But, but but they're not going to grow if you don't get them in the room and, and talk to them. Uh, I'm about to wrap up here pretty quickly, but I just want to go through a couple of questions here um, that are, since this is the 50th anniversary of hip-hop, so I would like to have hip-hop opinions from one of the greatest rappers of all time. So uh, we'll start with this. This week, a big conversation was Ice Cube versus Biggie Smalls, who had the better career, we'll say. Now, I know there's a lot of ways to look at this, but when you have Ice Cube and Biggie Smalls next to you, who is greater in your opinion? I'm not answering that question, man. That, that, that's no bueno for me. Uh, because I love and respect both of them so much for, for different reasons. I hear me in Smalls. You know, I can hear me in there. And so if you're going to say, put the gun to my head, then I got to pick Smalls because I can hear me. Um, but I grew up with Cube and I know how powerful Cube is, you know? Uh, and so, man, there, I look at the, the things in, 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 in terms of tears, makes it easier for me. And they're both tier one guys, you know. And so, how do you how do you differentiate one uh, top one top tier guy from the next top tier guy? It's just you know we're art. We are, we all stand on the shoulders of those guys that came before us. Um, no Grandmaster Melly Mel, no either of those guys. And so, how do you go past Melly Mel and choose one of them when they both took? And, and Cube, especially Schooly D. How do you just jump over Schooly D and, and not give him his? Because those cadences that Cube used through Ice-T came from Schooly D, you know? So we're all bits and pieces of a much larger puzzle. And I think that us taking that time to try to differentiate who is somebody when it's all God is, a, is number one, is a waste of time. Number two is where the bullshit comes from, right? Because we're all brothers. We're all trying to get to the same place and do the same thing, which is feed our families and raise the, the awareness in our community, raise the stakes of business to get those people in our communities to understand their own self-worth. And that, can you imagine how much money those two guys that you mentioned have made? What if all of that money went back to their communities that they will come from, not throw Jay-Z in there, not throw Dre and his. So the battle ain't between those individuals. It's between the systems they've connected to, right? We have to figure out a way to, to uh, gentrify, for lack of a better way of putting it, those systems so that all those guys get a chance to equally be the shit. We all are, uh, Hip hop, we all are uh, uh, Jay Z's. We all are Eminem's. We all are Lil Wayne's. You know, on our own level, and there are tears to this stuff. You know, but we all great. Is No Vaseline the greatest diss track of all time? Maybe, maybe. Um, Cause I'm a Biggie Smalls guy, so hit it up, hit him up. I didn't like that much, but I'm an NWA guy, you know. But end up, but no Vaseline. I love that one. That was a great fucking record. And then you got to go all the way back to the bridges over, and you know, I mean, 
that kind of thing goes a long way back. But even then, those diss tracks were meant to elevate each other. Now in these days, we're using it to kill each other. You see the difference? Wait, 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 wait. I got to ask you a question on this. There is a line... Is it the bridge is over or is it South Bronx? I can't remember. The bridge is over has got a line where it says Roxanne Shante is only good for steady fucking. Was that is that elevate? Is that part well, of the on, track meant to elevate us? Come on, man. That, this is that you're talking about when hip hop was in their growing pains, and that's how you differentiate yourself, differentiate yourself one from the other. Maybe it was a little much, you know, but that's how they did it back then. You know, but it was, they wasn't talking about nobody's wives and, you know, they hadn't, you hadn't crossed that, that barrier, um, in the game. And so I wasn't one that was really about, uh, one, one of the reasons I, you loved the posse cuts is because everybody was on the same team, uh, fighting as a unit, but yeah, bro, Bria, a Sh- a Shan, and KRS One, they had a nice one there for for a minute. On Defiant Ones, there's a scene. I think it was Defiant Ones. There's a scene where M is uh, trying to recite. I think it's mind blowing. Was it mind blowing? I think it's what it is. He was trying to he was trying to recite uh, one of your verses, and uh, yeah, it was mind blowing. I think it was mind blowing. And he said, "Oh, I need Doc for a second. And so he calls you over while they're shooting in the documentary, and he's asking you to explain, you know, uh, this part of his rhyme, his lyrics, that he kept messing up over, over time. What does it feel like having so many iconoclasts at this point now, right? You got Snoop, you got M, you've got an uh, entire history of hip-hop that reveres you for the work that you put in. What is a moment like that where Eminem is breaking that down? How does that impact you? How did it impact you then, but how does it impact you now when you think about the things you have to do going forward from here? I gotta ask him what he said on this part. On this one part, I never understood it. Like, I couldn't make out exactly what it was. The doc is dope. I would have been down with rock, but I'll be broke by the punk. I'm opening up my trunk to reveal that, live it or not, my life is like a story. Yelling it because nobody else is telling it, checking it, always getting paid because the rap is sort of a twist. Between what you needed and what I mean, what I mean by twist, nah, you got to listen. That, what the fuck what was that right there? Never a segment is negative because I'm employing what you've been missing. Never, Never a segment, segment is negative because I'm employing you. How the fuck did you say that shit? God damn. She <laughs> just came out. Well, I, I knew at the moment of shooting, we were making gold. I knew that. I could feel it, you know. Again, to his credit, M is such a genuine human being, right? And a genuine fan of this art form that we all love. It's not his fault. He's great. You know what I mean? Doesn't matter what color you are. Right. It's not his fault. He has that gift to be able to take those cadences, some of mine I hear in there too, uh, and just work them that way. Right. That's his gift. His subject matter allowed him to reach into areas that the that the average copper colored artist could not. Um, just by virtue of it, uh, wh- who he is and where he came from. But that doesn't take away from the skill set. You still got to write the rap. You know what I mean? You still got to make the, make the song. And he had Dre, which is another cheat code, you know, uh, those two guys together. And Dre, Dre plus anybody, really, is you 75% over and done just by virtue of this guy's sitting behind this SSL for you, you know. It was a moment in time that'll live forever, bro. I know that right now. I know when I'm dead 50 years, people are going to be watching that going, that's pretty cool. You know, that's what it felt like in the moment. And I know you allowed, it allowed Eminem to Give love to his guy, because I've always been that to him. He always says stuff like, I get nervous around you. And I'm thinking to myself, motherfucker, 
You know what I mean? Like, do you know who you are? And I'm, now I'm nervous. Now I'm sweating because you didn't say that, you know. Uh, but it's just a mutual love and respect of two men who really love the art because it did for me everything that it did for him, you know, and we both realize and recognize that, you know. And uh, like I said, it's a moment of time that's going to live forever, and I'm grateful for that moment. Death Row Records, last year, big news for Death Row Records, 2022, Snoop Dogg officially acquired Death Row Records. It was announced. What do you think that means for the Death Row Records legacy, and how did you feel when you heard that announcement? I was ecstatic, you know, um, that, that, that the dog was able to do that because it says a lot for us as a people. It says a lot for us as a genre of music. It says a lot for us as West Coast artists that the one of the guys that built this machine can now own it and run it. And Snoop is a different breed uh, than... Suge and Eric, um, all gangster dudes, but Snoop was raised in the church too. Snoop was a God child, you know what I mean? Singing in the choir, that whole kind of thing. So I know Snoop, even though he's gonna stay tr true to those streets, that's where he, he come from, but he's gonna do death row in a way that it could be a positive influence on the community. That's the most important aspect of that for me, that Snoop can take death row and make it mean something other than this is where guys get beat up or this is where guys get taken advantage of or this is where crime is. But he can make it mean that this that we're going back into our communities as men uh, and changing the dynamics of how our young men are getting raised up, young men and women, through this vehicle that we call the music that we have helped to create. We're going to change the narrative behind how it's uh, processed and how it's put out into that space. And that's something that I take extremely seriously that I'm so glad to be celebrating hip hop's 50, 50th birthday. I'm so glad that I get to make a reemergence, for lack of a better way of putting it, on hip hop's birthday. But I'm more concerned with hip hop's next 50 than, than hip hop's last 50. That's what's important to me because I get to do that from Dallas. I get to make Dallas Fort Worth a national, DFW gets to become a national kind of deal. And I get to stand out in front of these folks and say that the kids in Dallas Fort Worth deserve these opportunities to blow and grow in that space, just like any other major city in this United States. And I'm going to stomp on the streets down there until it happens for them. No doubt. That's dope, man. That's all I have. Is there anything else that you want to make sure comes through in the conversation? Yeah, I want to, I want to, uh, I want to talk about something called the dreams experience. The dreams experience is a educational platform. In my mind's eye and my vision, it's going to be a event center based around gaming, entertainment, arts, and technology. That is the Web3 space in the future. It is going to be the most influential way to connect and educate our kids that we've touched in many, many moons. Um, and it's gonna be a huge thing that, that christens itself here in the Dallas area. And it is the future of education. It is the future of connection through educating and into the future of connecting our children from both sides because the connection is where the change happens. That's a quote from at and I think I stole that from them. So y'all don't, don't get mad at me. Uh, they got a big presence down here. So I'm courting them too. 
Um, AT&T, we need your help. And the Mavericks and the Cowboys. And I need everybody that's that's worth their salt in Dallas Fort Worth that wants Dallas Fort Worth to be that shining city on the hill that everybody talks about. I want them to come help me make this vision a reality. And uh and not only that, anybody in in the world, because by the time I'm done, the dreams experience will live in the metaverse. So wherever you are, wherever you are in on the globe, whether you're in Dubai or China, you'll be able to come and get some of this curriculum from the dreams experience between me and some of my friends, um, no matter where you are. You know what I mean? Because like I said, it's the future of connection. And that's what I want to see happen in Dallas. And that's what I want to, uh, if anybody knows me and wants to help me and wants to be a part of what I'm trying to do in the future with the time that G.O.D. has given me and the opportunity that it's given me, because I don't have 500 million bucks I could give to USC. I just don't got it like that. But what I do have, I ain't got 10 million I can get to Compton. But what I do have is ideas and what I have is connections. What I have is passion and desire to create the change from the bottom up instead of the top down. So if you're rocking with Doc, remember what I'm telling you about the dreams experience. There'll be a way that you can help me soon enough. I'll give it out to the world. And I told folks on the internet, if there's anything that the DOC could do for you, think about what that is. If there's anything the DOC could do for you, find me and I'll do it for a donation to this project. It's cut and dry. That's beautiful. Peace and love, Word up, my brother. Man. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you for everything, man. God bless.